Good evening. It's uh, it's great to see you. I, I wish I could see you in the under different conditions. Um, I, I wish, you know, this is the church I grew up in. So many of you have known me since I was born. Uh, so many of you taught me in my Bible classes. I went to school with your kids. I, maybe I went to school with some of your grandkids. And I've grown up knowing you uh, more than just people I go to church with. You're my family. And I... I wish with my whole heart I could give each one of you a hug like I always do because I love you. I always have and I always will. Uh, and I hate that I can't. And I, I want you to know if I don't touch you, if I don't shake your hand, and it's not because I don't love you. It's because I'm worried about your health. I'm worried about the health of my family. Um, and I don't want anyone to get sick because because that would be bad, okay? Um, but I do love you. And I'm so great and honored to stand before you this, this evening and present a lesson from God's Word. And, and typically when I come here for your uh, sermon series, I usually do more of a Bible class type thing. However, since I'm so far away from y'all, and a lot of you are wearing masks, I found out a few weeks ago at Perryville, it's hard to answer questions when people have masks on. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to touch your mask, and the first thing everybody was doing was grabbing them and pulling them and pulling them away from their face to answer the question and letting them go. And I don't want anyone to get popped in the face. So uh, we'll just do a, a more of a sermon type thing as I've been instructed to do, and, and uh, we'll get through this together. Our first passage we're going to look at will be Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. There's, there's three very distinct passages we're going to look at tonight, and and... Believe it or not, I've had a hard time with this lesson, this getting getting ready for this lesson this evening. Uh, and that's kind of sad because of what my subject is, searching for truth. And what's even worse, in, in my opinion, in, in my own eyes, is this is actually a topic I've struggled with these last four months, it seems like. I've struggled with searching for truth. There was a few weeks ago, and I, some of y'all saw it, and some of y'all didn't. And if you go look for it now, it's already been deleted. A few weeks, I guess over a month ago now, uh, I shared a, a, uh, a article, just a newspaper article on my Facebook page, okay, my Facebook profile. It was just about an event that took place uh, around one of the protests in, in Washington, D.C., and, and this article gave a very specific timeline of how certain events took place and what all uh, it entailed and what all happened with this and, and that and, and the other and the way it was organized with the videos within the article and the way the timeline was set up, I believe that article would be true and so I shared it as a shockingly event that I believed had, had happened. Um, then, not only that, people started commenting on that, on that Facebook post I made, and they started, started arguing me about this and that and the other, and instead of letting it go, you know what I did as a reaction? I doubled down. <laughs> because I'm 31 years old, and I thought I knew it all, and I thought I knew they were wrong. And so I doubled down on it, and it became this giant Facebook argument where nobody looks pretty. Essentially, you know, you know what happens when you wrestle with the pigs? You, you come out covered in mud. That's how we all ended up. And it was a sermon I heard from a friend of mine named Marcus Stinson that following, he gave it on Sunday. I, I watched it online on, on Monday. And it was a sermon entitled Black and White. And in the sermon, he goes through and he talks about how Facebook works and how social media works. He talks about the algorithm. Not only he talks about the algorithm, he talks about how um, mainstream media, that term's abused all the time, isn't it? And how media sources abuse the algorithm. And how when they post something they, they believe that Facebook believes you're already going to like or you're already going to share, they put it in front of you to make sure you see it so you'll like it and share it. It's part of the reason why we've become so divided as a nation. Because you have people who are already right, who already lean to the right. You know what they see? Articles they already probably agree with. And the people who lean to the left, you know what they see? 
articles they probably already agree with. And what's it's so sad because we can't even argue or we can't even discuss the facts because so many times we're looking at two completely different sets of facts because they've been misconstrued in such a way to where it's presented before us with a right lean or a left lean. It turns out the facts I had shared ended up possibly not even being real. That there were other major news outlets who were reporting different facts about what took place. And in that sermon, he reminded me of something that I, it's sad I needed to be reminded of. And it's an idea that I'm going to bring before you tonight as we go through this lesson. Folks, there's only one source of truth. It don't come from CNN. It don't come from Fox News. You won't find it on a lot of social media. You won't see it in the mainstream media, whatever that term means anymore. You won't see it in the newspaper. You won't see it in, in news articles. You won't see it on the news, on TV. You don't see it anywhere. You only find it in one place, and that's this book right here. It's the only source that has no left agenda or has no right agenda. It's the only source of absolute truth. And I feel like we forgot that, or I forgot that in the search of trying to find out all the things that have happened. And I've given up finding all the things that have happened because I've decided there's only one thing that really matters. And that's what's in this book. So tonight, I want to go back to the basics. I want to talk about the one true Savior. The one who saves us from sin. The one who saves us from damnation. And now he's the only one who does so. I want to talk about where we search for the truth. And the only place we can look, as I've already mentioned tonight, is in this book. And I want to talk about the one true way of life. And how searching for that way of life doesn't stop when we come in contact with Jesus. If anything, that searching for that way of life starts after we come in contact with the cross. After we've been buried with him in baptism. We're going to realize that to search for Righteous living starts when we attain faith. It doesn't end when we attain faith. And that's what we'll be doing this evening. Um, if you're already there, I'm, I'm sure many of you are, we'll be in Romans chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 together. Romans 1, 1 through 7 together. Paul writes, Paul a bondservant. Of Christ Jesus called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace, an apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Among them you also are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God in Rome. Called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the opening, how Paul starts the opening of the book of Romans. And so many times we've preached through Romans and we've preached through Romans and we've preached through Romans and this is kind of a part that we tend to skim over a little bit. Oh, it's just an introduction. He's just saying hello and who sent him and what Jesus is all about. And I want to take time not to stop for a minute and actually soak this all in because you know what he does? He summarizes the gospel. He summarizes the plan of salvation here in just this simple greeting. 
Look at verse 1. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, a slave of Christ Jesus. Paul, an individual who has made Jesus Christ his master, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised, which who promised, which God promised beforehand, before who? Before Jesus Christ came, before the New Testament, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You know what he's saying here? He's saying the same God of the Old Testament who sent Moses, who sent Elijah, who sent Elisha, who sent them to the world to declare that they were doing wrong, who sent Isaiah, who sent Jeremiah, who sent Daniel. That same God I serve. Not as a prophet, but as an apostle. As an apostle is something different. Why? Because the gospel had come. The gospel that he promised through those prophets. The gospel that he promised through that Old Testament. Through the old law as it were. The gospel, verse 3, that is, concerns his son. Concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Who was a descendant in the line of David. Who came through the line of Judah. Who by coming through the line of Judah. Who by coming through the line of David. Would have fulfilled many prophecies in the Old Testament. He's backing up his already, I guess, thesis that he's made about the Old Testament prophets in verse 2. Verse 4, who was declared the Son of God, his Son who came by the seed of David, who proved to be the Son of God, who declared that he was the Son of God with power. Not just by words, but with power. Power by doing what? By the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit. Jesus Christ our Lord. He names him again here. He tells us who Jesus is in verse 1. And then he goes through how Jesus wasn't just a mere man, but how he was the one who was promised by God in the Old Law and the Old Testament by the prophets who came through the seed of David fulfilling the prophecies that were given about him, about the Messiah that was, and come, that was to come into the world. How he came and he was born and he came with power proving he was the Son of God by resurrecting from the dead. Once again, how do you resurrect? Well, in order to resurrect, you got what? You got to die. You have to die. But here he is declaring what Jesus, who Jesus is, and what the main mission was for him to do. That he was the Son of God. That he fulfilled the prophecies. He came through the seed of David. He came, he lived, he died, and he resurrected from the dead. But he doesn't just stop there. Continuing on through verse 5. Through whom? Through who? Through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. He said, we bring, as an apostleship, we have received grace, and we have come, and we have been seen here as apostles, to bring about obedience from Gentiles, to bring about faith and action from Gentiles. He came, he lived, he died, he rose from the grave, and he has sent us so the world can know who he is. He gives us the truth here. And not just the truth of who Jesus is, but the mission that Jesus has sent here to do. The truth of the mission that God has sent us here to do. Declare to all people who our Savior is. To prove to people that He is the Son of God. That He is God in the flesh. That He came, they lived, they died, they rose from the grave so that we can believe, so that we can have faith, so that we may obey, and we may have salvation. He says in this text that he was sent by the one Savior, the one true Savior, the only one who ever was and whoever has been the Son of God. 
and probably not has been, probably a better term would be who is the Son of God because he is living and active today. I chose this text, and I could have chose tons of texts from the New Testament about who Jesus is, but I chose this one specifically because Paul's writing to individuals who already understand this. I figured I'd be standing before people who are already Christians. And I want us to take time to look at how Paul would have described it to us, how he described it to the Church of Rome, and I want to use this text for us to soak in that he's saying these things that he knew they already believed. He summarized them so quickly because he was already accepting it that the Church of Rome had already accepted this as a given because of their faith. Just like many of us here have been Christians for years. Many of you have been Christians since before I was born. Many of you have memorized scripture since before I was born. You know this to be true. You know it to be a given. But it's important for us to start here. Because until you can talk about the way of life, the true way of life, there's no point in talking about the true way of life unless you already have the one true Savior. Turn to first, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1. I want to begin in verse 2 in this text. And I'm going to look at verses 2 through verse 8, and we're going to make a, a major focus on verses 5 and 6. I, I just want to put some context into it first. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, looking at verses 2, we're going to look read verses, verses uh, 2 down through verse 8 and following. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life, and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence verse 4 for by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust verse 5 now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge and in your knowledge self-control and in your self-control perseverance and in your perseverance godliness and in your godliness brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness love for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our lord jesus christ in this text you know what i call this text I call it the outline of spiritual growth. In this text, it gives us qualities that all Christians should do daily to help increase spiritual growth in our life. He gives us things that we need to apply so that we can bear good fruit, so that we can grow, so that we can serve, and people will see godliness in God in our daily life. And I want to begin at verse 5 and, and look at them again. Now this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your moral excellence, knowledge in your knowledge, self-control in your self-control, perseverance in your perse excuse me, in your perseverance, godliness in your godliness, brotherly kindness in your brotherly kindness, love. He gives these, this list here. Now once again, it's important for us to ask the question, who is Peter talking to? Once again, he's talking to people who already understand who Jesus is. He says this in verses uh, 2, 3, and 4. Individuals who already have the true knowledge of Jesus. Individuals who already have the true knowledge of God, or the, excuse me, the true knowledge of the Son of God. Or maybe even a better term for this, a better translation is the true acknowledgement of who Jesus is. Individuals who already knew the information that, that Paul described in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, information that was already common to them that what we find in the Gospels proved that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came, they lived, that He died, He rose from the grave, and that He's coming back, and all these things are fulfilled, or, or all these things fulfilled Old Testament law, Old Testament passages, Old Testament prophets, and law 
and the like. But Peter reminds them something here. And it's something that so many Christians forget. Our spiritual walk doesn't end with baptism. Folks, when you come out of the water, you're just getting started. It doesn't end there. That really is the starting point for spiritual life. So many times we talk about searching for truth or seeking truth. We, we, we uh, emphasize the fact that people are seeking for Jesus Christ, that we should be seeking for Jesus Christ. But there's so much more truth for us to go after. That searching for the true way of life doesn't start at baptism. But after. That growing faith doesn't end with baptism, but begins after we're baptized. Or maybe I should say, starts once we're baptized. Listen to what he says. Now, this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge what do we apply once we become christian what do we need to apply to our faith the first thing list here is moral excellence the things that you already know you should be doing start doing those things the things that you know you shouldn't be doing anymore stop doing those things the second thing we must add to that after we start applying that that spiritual discipline to our lives is we got to take up God's word and study it. Because there's no way, there's no way we know all the things that we should be doing. The next question I have for you tonight is, when does that study stop? You know, here in, in this text it says, you know, you add moral excellence to your faith, and then after you add moral excellence, you, you add knowledge. When do we stop adding that knowledge? When do we stop adding that moral excellence? Never. And yet, how many Christians fill churches? Do they come to church, they sit in the pew, they sing the songs, and they go home, and they never open this book up again? Pews. Pews filled with people who never added knowledge after their baptism. Pews filled with people who quit searching once they entered and left the water. There's only one true way of life. And if we don't know it, it's our own fault. God has given it to us plainly, clearly, in a very concise way. The last thing that we need to continue to look at when we talk about this idea of searching for truth is I want to ask the question, where are you searching? Where are you searching? You know, I told you a story a while ago about the articles and how every article we, we see before us this, this moment of time is, con is construed one way or the other. It's been manipulated one way or the other to get us to, and the ones that we probably already agree with are the ones that we're more likely to see before us. You know, I, I almost brought a chart with me to put up here on the, on the screens, and it was a chart that looked at all the major news networks, and it categorize them by the right, left, or in the middle. And then I thought about that for a minute. I thought, well, who made the chart? <laughs> I didn't trust the chart, so I, I didn't bring it with me. But you know what I'm talking about. Folks, the world's full of people who lie. The world's full of people who manipulate. The world's, the world's full of people who, who their only agenda 
is to get us to think like them. Not to change the world in a positive way, but to just get us to think like them. And they'll write articles and books and do whatever it is by any means necessary to make us change our minds. But folks, there's only one book that makes the world better. There's only one book that actually makes us better, stronger people and better citizens with strong characters. And I don't want us to turn at this moment to Psalms chapter 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's in the middle of the longest book of the Bible. We're not going to look at the whole chapter. But it is interesting to me because you know what this chapter is about? It's an entire chapter. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And it's an entire chapter that's about how great God's word is for us. I want to look at verses 105 of Psalm 119. I want to look at verses 105 through 112. The psalmist writes, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. You know what he starts out by saying? He says, look, your word is what guides me every single day. Your word is what reveals the path I should be on, the path, the road I should be taking. I have sworn I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. I am exceedingly conflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O, oh, accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in your hand, yet I do not forget your law. You know what he's asking for? He's literally begging God, teach me your word. Teach me your law. Give me your book. When was the last time we begged for this book? Verse 110, The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. He said, look, the wicked ones are trying to trick me. Satan's trying to get me to fall. People are trying to get me to trip. But it's your law that keeps me going. It's your light that keeps me steady. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Your word gives me joy. Your word is my path. Your word is the light for my path. The world tricks me. Satan tricks me. It gets me to stumble. It tries to ensnare me. It tries to tangle me up. But it is your holy word that helps me see those snares. That helps me see those tricks. That helps me see those paths. Folks, I'm telling you. It is the only God that can. Folks, any other God, any other book is going to drive you headfirst in those tricks and traps and snares. But it's God's word that shines that light that reveals them all before us. Where are you searching for truth? Because, folks, I'm telling you, the answer, or I shouldn't even say the answer, truth isn't out there. It's not on TV. It's not on the news. It's not on your Facebook page. Truth is only found in one spot, and it's right here in this book. 
We don't stop studying and we become a Christian. If anything, that's when we are, our uh, knowledge even should begin to grow even more. And we should study more and we should strive more. And we should hunger more. What's your God? Is it God's word? Or is it something else? And if it's not God's word, I pray and I beg and I plead that you make it God's word tonight, that you make Jesus Christ your Savior tonight, that you make him the Lord of your life tonight. The Bible tells us, this, this word tells us, this perfect book that makes men perfect and makes men equipped and makes people holy. This book tells us that all those who believe in Jesus Christ, all those who believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came, who lived, who died, who rose from the grave, and who's coming back, that all those who confess this before mankind, that all those who turn away from the world and turn toward his book and turn toward his will and turn toward his way, and all those who put him on in baptism, those that are buried with him and brought up into his resurrection in water, and all those who walk in the light as he himself is in the light, who walk down the narrow road that leads to the narrow gate, that leads to eternal life. That all those who believe, confess, repent, or be baptized and walk faithfully until death, they receive a reward. And all those who don't will be punished forever. Make this book your guide. Make Jesus Christ your Lord. Folks, you'll never regret it. You'll become part of a church. You'll become part of the kingdom. You'll receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and you will have hope of eternal life. If there's anything you need, please let us know as we sing.